on this amazing morning of the triumphant entry of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are joining the whole community of faith. We are joining our ecumenical team within Livala, Kawata, Kamwala. We are joining the different nations of the world. And we are joining families everywhere that are streaming live now and joining us as together we say Hosanna. If you have a branch in your hands, remember we had declared earlier that you have to do a procession around your house. And I hope that this morning you did the procession to mark your territories and to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. When you walked around, you were marking your boundaries for the year ahead. When you walked around, you were declaring your victory everywhere. And so wherever you are in that room, lift something. It might be a mantle, it might be a palm branch or a leaf branch. Just lift it and say with me, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Just do Ntunguru as my wherever you are. Declare Ntunguru, 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 Ntunguru. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I will share with you this morning on a very interesting subject and I encourage you to, to pay close attention. The Lord as well took me through a journey of revelation concerning the triumphant entry that I did not see from this perspective, especially that it's a first triumphant entry celebration in this decade that we are entering together with the Lord. It is a celebration done in the time of COVID-19 and we are speaking that an entry will happen to us. And so the subject of my discussion with you is when the end meets the beginning. When the end meets the beginning, purpose is fulfilled. When the end meets the beginning, purpose is fulfilled. And Matthew 21 verse 4 to 5 puts it beautifully in that passage. It says, all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. Lowly, sitting on a donkey, a coat, the fowl of a donkey. Let us pray. Lord, our hearts are open to you. Our minds are open. And we ask that you will speak and that we will hear you by the hearing of our spirit and of our ears. Amen. So you may comfortably take your seats in your home. Make sure you have your Bible in your hands. You have a notebook and you have a pain as we dive in together into the awesome and beautiful word of God. When the end meets the beginning, purpose is fulfilled. Today as we celebrate Jesus entering into Jerusalem, you must always understand that as we come to Palm Sunday, what must happen at Palm Sunday and at Passover is that the end must meet the beginning. It's two things that will always happen. There must be an end and there must be a beginning as we draw nigh to the place of Passover and also of Palm Sunday. And I pray as you have gone through year round, at this time, your end must meet your beginning. Why do we say that? Because the month that we are in now is the beginning of the ecclesiastical calendar year. And we run from this month of the Passover which is April and we'll run up to March. In March we close the ecclesiastical calendar year. And therefore when we arrive in the month of the Passover the end of the ecclesiastical calendar in March must meet the beginning of the new calendar year in April. So, we are saying when the end and the beginning meet, purpose is fulfilled. It means, therefore, that by this time, your purpose for the past year must have been fulfilled. And because you are beginning again in the new 
ecclesiastical calendar year, you have to reset and reestablish your purpose for the year ahead. By the time we arrive in March next year, your purpose for the year 2020 should have closed. When the end meets the beginning, purpose is established. Apart from that, friends, we are entering what is we call in the Anglican Church the Holy Week. The Holy Week is an intense time when we draw nigh and closer to the Lord. In the Holy Week, we celebrate the final parts of the journey of our Lord Jesus Christ leading up to the cross until to his resurrection. But what agrees with this message today that when the end meets the beginning, there are a number of things that happen in this Holy Week. One of them is a service we call the chrism service. In the chrism service, every priest is called upon to renew their priestly vows. And they renew their commitment to canonical obedience and to be led and to be guided under the hand and the leadership of their diocesan bishop. Why do we renew our ministerial vows in this time? Because in this time, the end meets the beginning. So it meant last year when I renewed my vows, I walked the all year round. And as I come to the chrism service this week, I have ended the purpose of last year. I am getting a new mandate for the year ahead. And that is why priests always meet on the chrism service to, and to declare the beginning of a new season in our ministry. Apart from that, the chrism service is for the blessing of the oils to be used during the year. So the message is that for the whole year round, we have used the oils that were anointed at the last chrism service. As we come to bless new oils this week, we are saying to the Lord, my lamp will not grow dim. I renew the oil of my ministry. Again, the end meets the beginning. While the oil of the past season is coming to an end, the oil of the new season is being poured into my lamp. While the zeal of the past season is nearing its fulfillment, the new zeal is lifted into my soul. And I make a fresh commitment. Why? The end meets the beginning. And purpose is fulfilled. Apart from that, we will meet on Thursday. This week, we're not meeting on Wednesday. We'll meet on Thursday at 17.30 to celebrate the Monday Thursday. Monday Thursday speaks to us two things. The institution of the Holy Eucharist, which symbolizes our close walk with the Lord. So as we partake and declare the institution of the Holy Eucharist, we are saying, by the strength of the body and the blood of Jesus, I'm ready for a new beginning. As we are reminded secondly about seven leadership, the washing of the feet, we are saying in that service, my feet have been walking for 12 months. As I come in this Monday Thursday, I would like my feet to be washed again for the beginning of a new ecclesiastical calendar year. Again, the end meets the beginning. The touch that was on your foot has run all year round. And now a new touch must be given to your foot for a new energy and new strength. And in essence, you have ended one cycle, you have begun another. And then from then, on Friday, we'll be here from 9 to 10.30 as we begin to celebrate the Good Friday. And we will call it good because it surely is a Good Friday. On Saturday, from 18 hours, the service of the light. We will chant the Easter tide and we will announce the light of the Lord in the darkness. And we will celebrate on Sunday at 7.30 that the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And so the end meets the beginning. Purpose is fulfilled. If I was going to choose another theme for today, I would have said when the end meets the beginning, you have come full cycle. Do you choose which one seems nicer for you? When the end meets the beginning, purpose is fulfilled. Or when the end meets the beginning, you have come full cycle. What do we mean by this? I will dive in together with you and follow through as we examine the three readings which are core to our message today. The triumphant entry to Jerusalem brought Jesus to both the end and the beginning 
of his ministry. And I'll be explaining to you how it brought him to this point. And the end and beginning is the key purpose of every Passover season. The end and the beginning remains the key purpose of every Passover. This means if Passover is going to make sense for you, there must be an end to something. And there must be a beginning to something. Again, I encourage every national leader, every family leader, business leader, beyond this time, don't go back to business as usual. Something new must begin in you. Your walk with the Lord must have been renewed. Your dedication to God must have been renewed. And we honor the Lord for all of you that are faithfully following us live, even in your home, throughout this season. You haven't said, praise the Lord, no more church, I will just sleep. No, I know many of you woke up this morning, you took your shower, and I know many of my elders dress themselves nicely, they carry their handbag, and they put the, their cup of tea there, and they sit before the screen, and you're joining into the service. May the Lord bless you for that. And we were also blessed for many of you who have remained faithful to give to the Lord even in this time. And hence we had that offering in this past week. The Lord will honor you. Every time you give online, a name Robert Peewee will pop up. Is a name of our accountant. So don't run away or be scared. So two outstanding aspects of the life of Jesus meet at the triumphant entry. There are two areas of his life that meet at the triumphant entry and that is where the meat of our message is today the first aspect takes him to the beginning so the first thing that happens at the triumphant entry takes him to the beginning and the beginning is about kingship the beginning of jesus life's ministry is about kingship and so in the first place, because the end meets the beginning, it takes him to the beginning of all things in the triumphant entry. How? In our second reading in Philippians 2 and verse 6, he is proclaimed in these beautiful and wonderful words. Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Meaning that right from the beginning. He existed equal with God. That is why we pray. In the name of God the Father. The Son and the Holy Spirit. Expressing themselves in three. And yet one God. So he was standing in the place of kingship. Equal with God. So that is the first thing. In our gospel reading. Matthew 21 verse 5 also affirms the same thing just the first part will come to the second part later he says tell daughters of zion see your king is coming to you your king is coming to you it is taking him to the beginning to his kingship he is he was equal with god he is the king that is coming john chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 if you're not sure about the beginning of jesus john puts it beautifully Children like saying in the beginning. That I'll say in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So again, it takes him to the beginning where he is the alpha of everything else and it is this beginning the kingship that he walked away from he walked away from his kingship and now in the triumphant entry he is returning to back to his kingship he walked away from kingship and he came and humbled himself for our salvation in the triumphant entry he begins to return to the place of his kingship there are times when God wants you to fulfill something and he will make you walk away from something that you may fulfill his purpose and return to what you walked away from. I think you have seen people in, in conversations. They'll be talking about something and they're trying to make a point. They abandon what they were talking about. They use another route in the end to explain what they were trying to explain in the beginning. 
But if you are not very focused, when you use a different route, you even forget in the end what you were trying to say at the beginning. When you are traveling to another city, sometimes the road may have difficulties. You may use a different route. You divert, you abandon the original route that you may use another route. In the end, you must end up at the beginning of what you were supposed to do. So Jesus walked away intentionally from his kingship that he may render service to humanity. And I pray today, whatever you walked away from, for the sake of saving other human beings. May the Lord show you the way back to that place. If you had walked away from your family. Because you were trying to make ends meet. And so you are not spending time with your house. Now in this time of being in the house. The Lord is taking you back to what you walked away from. So you see this stay at home makes a lot of sense. now. He's taking you back to what you walked away from. And so Jesus is going back to his kingship. The second aspect in the triumphant entry takes him to the end. So the first aspect, to his kingship. The second aspect, to the end. The end is his servanthood. The end is his servanthood. And Philippians 2 verse 8, again a second reading, puts it very clearly in this way. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even to death on the cross so he went to the second aspect of his life servanthood the second part of Matthew 21 verse 5 also declares Philippians says he humbled himself to the point of death the second part of Matthew says your king is coming gentle and mounted on a donkey then he says even on a court the fowl of a beast of burden. So he is lowly. He has humbled himself as a servant. What do we mean, friends, by saying this? We are saying in the Passover season, a successful end only exists to pave the way for a fulfilled beginning. I'll repeat that. In the Passover season, and in the season of the triumphant entry, a successful end of anything only exists for the purpose of paving way for a fulfilled beginning. So two things are happening with Jesus in the triumphant entry. We are seeing a king and we are seeing a servant. One is coming to an end. One is coming to a new beginning full of power. But every end must be successful. Don't just end things for the sake of ending. End when success has been achieved. And I pray that during this season, whatever has to end in your life, that you will never end anything prematurely in your life from today. If you're among those who have been walking away from things prematurely from today, may the Lord give you the spirit of endurance. The tenacity to see the project to the end. And when it ends successfully, you can close it. Because your successful end will open a door for a fulfilled beginning. Amen. Have you noticed, if I can, you allow me to give an example of all our women because our gospel reading today says, tell the daughters of Zion. When a wonderful lady carries a pregnancy to tame, when a pregnancy has come to a successful end at nine months, it gives birth to a fulfilled beginning. Because when the baby is born, he or she finds the tank of milk ready for a new beginning. But have you noticed in the medical field, they'll tell you when the pregnancy has not come to full term, the milk struggles to come out. If a child has been born premature, they have to motivate you and, and do this or that for the milk to come out naturally. Why? Because for one reason or another, the pregnancy did not come to a successful end. And therefore, a fulfilled beginning cannot happen. If you are in grade 12, many of you who are studying for grade 12, I hope during this holiday you are studying and not just watching movies throughout in your house. A successful end of a grade 12 means you have qualified, you have passed. The moment you have the grades required, it paves way 
for a fulfilled beginning into the career of your life. But if you are bought grade 12 on the way, or you don't end it successfully, you cannot step in the beginning of your career. You have to do what they call repeat. If you ask the children of Israel, they know what it means to repeat. Because God told them you will reach the promised land in 40 days. But they did not successfully end their journey because fear crippled them. And they had to do a repeat. And a godly repeat changes from 40 days to 40 years. I don't know how many of you will stay in grade 12 for 40 years because of not ending successfully. And I pray that you, you, your life will not be postponed for anything. Your entry into your promised land will not be postponed for anything. That your success to a new beginning will not be postponed for any reason. And therefore a successful end paves way for a fulfilled beginning. When the end meets the beginning, you have come full cycle. Now look at Philippians. How he confirms the good beginning when you end well. Philippians 2 verse 9. Up to 11. Says for this reason. Now begin it a bit higher. So people can see where we are coming from. He says he humbled himself. By becoming obedient. To the point of death. Even death on the cross. Successful end. Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? When we come on Friday, I'll remind you, Lord, if it is possible, let this cup bypass me. He was about to abort and unsuccessfully end his mission. And he said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. For this cause I was born. And he successfully ended his ministry on earth. And that is why Palm Sunday leads him to a successful end. So he can begin. Now after he humbles and dies on the cross. Look at the fulfilled beginning. That begins for this reason. Praise the Lord. For this reason. God also highly exalted him. And gave him the name that is above every name. For this reason. What reason? For successfully ending the previous season. For concluding successfully, God gave him a name above every name. Not only that, look at the decorations of this name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those who are in heaven. In case the angels were becoming too proud and thought Jesus is too low, dying on the cross. He says at the mention of his name, even you in heaven shall bow. And everyone on earth shall bow. And everyone under the earth. In case the fish thought they could not bow to the name of Jesus. And that is why when he was dying on the cross. Graves opened to command everyone to bow. Even death bowed. Today I command the death that is coming prematurely into your life. To bow to the name of Jesus. Any sin, disease or sickness. Knocking at your door prematurely. To rob you of a successful end. I rebuke it now. In the name of Jesus Christ. And we release you from its dominion. In Jesus name. Somebody say amen. amen. And so he says. And every tongue should confess. That Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When the end meets the beginning, purpose is fulfilled. When the end meets the beginning, you come full cycle. Jesus came full cycle and now he was ready to be given an exalted name. John chapter 1 verse 14 gives us the two things again together. The end and the beginning. Verse 14. It says the word became flesh. And took resident among us. Servanthood. And not only that. We observed his glory. The glory as of the one and only son of God. Full of grace and truth. Kingship. So the word became flesh. And because he successfully dwelt among us. 
he revealed the glory like never before. Wherever you are, as long as you are successfully serving God in your career, you are successfully serving God in your family, may the glory locked on the inside of you be manifested among those around you. May it be said about you, we beheld the glory of God upon this man and upon this woman, upon the preacher, the marketeer, the political leader. We beheld the glory of God. Because you have successfully dwelt among others. Now listen to this. And this will help you understand further. Within Jesus sat the king and the servant. Within Jesus sat the king and the servant. And that is why the triumphant entry brings the two together. It is only at the triumphant entry when you see the servant and the king arrive together. And that's what makes this place a great place. Within you, friend, there is a king. Within you, there is a servant. Now you will notice that Jesus did not begin his ministry until he was 30 years old. Why? I believe the 30 years of Jesus' training taught him when to manifest one of the two. I say it again. The 30 years of Jesus' training on earth taught him when to manifest the servant and when to manifest the leader or the king. You ask yourself, why did Jesus have to wait for 30 years before he entered into his priestly office? Why not at 16? He would have more time. But he waited for 30 years and only did ministry for 3 years. And the three-year ministry has had an impact for over 2,000 years. Why? The 30 years of training taught him when to manifest the servant and when to rightly manifest the king. And that is a lesson to many of us today in this Palm Sunday celebration. You've got to learn when to manifest the servant in you and when to manifest the king in you. When he was going to the wedding in Cana, invited for a wedding, his mother said, this man will help these people, their wine has run out. Look at the answer of Jesus. What is it with you, woman? My time has not yet come. Why? You can't make me a king now. It's not yet my season to be a king. And every time he healed the sick or did a miracle, look what he told them. Do not tell anyone about it go only to the church give them your testimony and give your offering as a testimony but don't tell anyone about it why i am not yet a king because if people know about my greatness they will crown me as king ahead of my time he knew when to be a servant he knew when to be a king even at the time of the triumphant entry, when the people were saying, save us, save us, they thought his kingdom had come. But he says, my, my kingdom is not of this world. When he was going to the cross, he said, I can call a legion of angels and they will defend me. But it's not yet my time. I am not yet in the king's seat. I am still in the servant's seat. So do all you want to do when I'm a servant. Do your worst. Sooner than later, I will come as a king. So Jesus knew how to be a servant and how to be a king. One of the lessons you are learning today is that those of you who are called to ministry or to offices of political uh, assignments or business or anything else, learn when to be a servant. Learn when to be a king. Learn when you have to serve the people. And learn when you have to give them direction as their leader. Learn when you have to sit under the covering of your pastor. And learn when you have to rise in the place of your own authority. Don't rise ahead of your time. So I say it again. The 30 years taught him how to manifest the servant at the right time. And the king at the right time. When others saw him as a servant, they thought they could take advantage of him. When he realized they are stepping their boundaries, he shifted into his kingship. 
and told them, you brood of vipers. And they wondered, ah, this is a Jesus who looks very humble and he has been saving the people. How is he calling us a brood? He shifted to a kingship for a moment to let them know, just because I'm a servant, you can't take me for granted. There is a king inside me. Hit your chest three times and tell, say to yourself, there is a servant in me and there is a king in me. Lord, give me grace to know when to manifest the servant and when to manifest the king. If the king comes prematurely, he becomes a dictator. But when a king comes at the right time, he combines servanthood and kingship and he becomes an aroma of beauty. And that is very powerful today. Praise the Lord. Let me conclude with this. Why is it called the triumphant entry? Bear with us. We'll push a little bit ahead of time a little. Why is it called the triumphant entry? Number one. He successfully operated as a servant. Dealing with the root and the foundation. Because he was successful as a servant. That is why we are calling his entry the triumphant entry. How do we know he was successful as a servant? And look again the capacity of a king. Isaiah 50 verse 4 to 5. Use King James now. Look at what happened there. An amazing scripture. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. That I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He awakeneth morning by morning. He awakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. Verse 5. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious neither turned away my back. So you see the servant in not turning away his back because he's serving but you see the king in having the tongue of the learned. He has the tongue of the learned but when he comes among the weary he does not boast. He is not pompous. He knows the word to speak in season. So he knows, even if he's among the highest learned, he knows when to be a servant and when to be a king. So he says, he's given me a word for the weary. So I can speak to the weary. But my tongue is of the learned. He didn't go among them. And he says, you know, I am flabbergasted. As I stand perpendicular to the floor and parallel to the wall. Because you know I am of the learned. In these days of quarantinosity. No. Even though he was among the learned. He knew how to speak to the weary. The weary were very low. He lowered himself. So he successfully operated as a servant. He dealing with the root and the foundation. And how do we know? The other way we know. His last act. On the side of servanthood was to touch the lowest of humanity. And the lowest part of humanity is their feet. As he was wrapping up his servanthood, getting ready to enter his kingship, he said to seal it up. Let me touch the lowest part of humanity, the feet. And before that Passover in John 13, he washed their feet. I want to say much on that one. Thursday. Join us on Thursday. John 13, 3 to 5. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. This talks about what? Kingship. Kingship. All things are in his hands. And that he was come from God and went to God. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments. Meaning, as a king, he laid aside his kingship. Look at that. After he lays aside his kingship, he took a towel and guided himself in servanthood. 
in Jesus sat the king and the servant. Praise the Lord. Somebody say praise the Lord today. So he takes up the towel as a servant when he puts aside the kingship. And after that, he poureth water into a basin. He was not like Father Bob who says, Santos, can I have a basin? Pour water there. He pours himself the water. And he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was kidded. He touches the lowest part. But that lowest part was not for no reason. That is why this triumphant entry is crucial, friends. That lowest part. What was Jesus doing? As we go to the next slide. He was harvesting and restoring the glory of humanity. He was harvesting and restoring the glory of humanity. Because the glory of any human being is, is in, in their footsteps. When you stand, if you are able to stand where you are, you will notice the moment you stand, the whole weight of your life ends up on your feet. The weight of your degrees ends up on your feet. The weight of your money ends up on your feet. The weight of your talents ends up on your feet. The weight of your intellect ends up on your feet. Your feet are the last things to touch the earth. And Jesus sat at the feet of his disciples to wash them. He was harvesting and restoring the glory of humanity. Give God a clap of praise if you can. Yeah. How was he restoring the glory of humanity? Luke 19 verse 10. I need to push. I'm running out of time. Luke 19 and verse 10. He beautifully says. Luke 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. The funny thing in this message is that he is looking for what was lost in the feet of the people. Why is he looking at it in the feet of the people? Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. This is what explains why he is looking for the glory in the feet of the people. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. In the garden of Eden, Satan was bruising the heel of humanity and took the glory of human beings from their feet. Why did a snake hit their head? Why did a snake hit their heart? He was hitting the heel. Because in the heel, in our youthful language, you call it kaskonki. In the heel is the glory of the whole body. So when the enemy struck their heel, he took away the glory of a human being. That is why Adam and Eve began to hide. Because the glory was not in them. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you are fallen short of the glory, where is the glory? Somebody struck your foot where the glory is. And Jesus, before he goes to the cross, he says, let me go back to your feet and restore the glory that Satan stole from you. I am touching your feet. I am restoring the glory. And therefore he touched their feet. And restored the glory. Hallelujah. I feel his presence today. He is restoring your glory. Whatever glory has been struck by the enemy in your life. As Jesus touches your feet in the season of the Holy Week. I declare your glory restored. I declare your power restored. Your authority restored. In the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that has been striking at your foot, the Lord touches your foot again and says your pride is back. Your wealth is back. Your health is back. Your salvation is back. The glory of God is restored in your life again at the feet. Therefore, he touches their feet before he rides. He restores the glory. Amazing revelation. Now, look at this. After he finishes watching their feet, now he goes to the donkey. What is he doing? This is what he's actually doing. He now, go back to my notes. This is what he's doing. He carries this glory, 
restored and he puts it on a donkey without his feet touching the ground again. As per adventure, Satan wants to come again while he carries his own glory and the glory of every human being and walking on foot just in case Satan wants to strike him again. He sits on a donkey, his feet are not touching the ground. He is declaring there, the soil will not define me again. The fall of man will not define me again. But as he sits on a donkey, he announces, I am a king. I am a king. I came down to restore your glory as a servant. But now I am carrying it as a king. And guess what? He was riding on the worship of the people, bringing their glory to the throne of God riding on a donkey jesus wasn't really riding on a donkey he rode physically on a donkey but as the donkey was moving they shouted hosanna and praises he was riding on the praises of the people on the worship of the people he was riding that is why the pharisees did not say take away the donkey they said tell your disciples to stop making noise they are shouting heavily and Jesus said, at this hour, if they stop praising me, stones will rise. Why? I need some praise to ride upon. If a human won't give me praise, stones will give me praise. The unknown will give me praise. The Gentiles will give me praise. And that is why in this hour, no one and nothing shall take away praise out of your mouth because the Lord is riding on your praise he is riding on your praise carrying your glory to the crown he is carrying your glory to the throne of the father riding on the praises of his people so he rides on ride on ride on in majesty he rides on carrying that glory why because we are saying why is it triumphant he successfully finished his servanthood carried the glory and now he is moving it is triumphant lastly second number two why is it triumphant is because he connects with the crown he connects with kingship kingship is jerusalem jerusalem was also called uh, zion so Jerusalem is the center of activity. So when he connects to Jerusalem, he is connecting to the city of David, the city of a king. The city of God is Jerusalem. So he is carrying your glory into the crown of Jerusalem, into kingship. But how does he do it? Riding on a donkey was not humility. Sometimes we have misunderstood it. It was not humility. Riding on a donkey was the splendor of kingship and servanthood at the same time. Kingship, because you displayed the splendor of his glory. Servanthood, because a donkey is an animal of labor. Now guess what? Your glory was so heavy that a horse could not carry your glory. Your glory was so heavy that a chariot could not carry your glory. Your glory could only be carried by a donkey. You may ask why. It is only a donkey in the Bible that spoke to Balaam and rebuked him. When the donkey saw the angel. When the man could not see the angel, the donkey could see the angel. When the man could not recognize a king, the donkey could recognize a king. And therefore the donkey became a place of royalty and a place of burden, servanthood. In the donkey, a king and a servant met. Judges 5 verse 10. I don't have all the time. Let me read, let's read it quickly. Judges 5 verse 10 says, Speak ye that ride. Give me the other simplified version. That is one of the words we have. Yes. You who ride on white donkeys, who sit on the saddle blankets, and who travel on the roads, give praise. That was the splendor of the king, traveling on roads, riding on a white donkey. And Zechariah 9 verse 9 to 10 fulfills that prophecy that he gave. 
Rejoice greatly, daughter of Jerusalem. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a cot, the fowl of a donkey. And what day will he do? I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed and he will proclaim peace. And hence Jerusalem is a city of peace. Peace to the nations. His dominion will extend from sea to sea. From Euphrates river to the ends of the earth. And today we declare peace be still. In every nation struggling with COVID-19, peace be still. In every so-called epicenter, peace be still. For the king is riding to the city of peace. And our friends, why was it a triumphant entry as we bring the two together? It is because, number three, he successfully touched the lowest and the highest in his life. And therefore the entry is a triumphant entry. And the people who were praising Jesus knew prophetic praise. They didn't just sing a song, Hosanna, because it is Hosanna. They knew prophetic praise. Hosanna means save us, save us. But look at something very interesting in Matthew 21 and verse 9. And I need to get out of your way. Look at what it says there. Then the crowds went ahead of him. Judah goes first. Praise goes first. No matter how much your praise shall be attacked this month, in the month of praise, may nothing steal away the praise out of your mouth. The people who went ahead of him and those who followed him kept on shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I don't know if you see the prophetic praise there. Prophetic praise is that when they said Hosanna to the son of David, they were announcing him as a servant. As a servant who came down in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes from heaven, who comes from kingship among men in the name of the Lord. They were announcing him as a servant. Hosanna to the son of David. But they did not end there. Then they announced him also. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They announced him as a king. So we announce you as a servant. We announce you as a king. We declare Hosanna as a servant. And Hosanna as a king. And successfully he touched the lowest and the highest. That is why it is a triumphant entry. He walked among the lowly. He overcame. He walked among the great and never considered equality with God as anything to boast about. He conquered even in greatness. Don't be among those who are given just a little power and you grow horns. Little power and you grow wings. In the place of power, Jesus conquered. In the place of humility and poverty, Jesus conquered. Poverty did not make him become a sinner to survive. He was with nothing, but he survived. He was with everything, but he never became pompous. He touched the lowest and the highest. And prophetically they announced, Hosanna to the son of David and Hosanna to the highest heaven because now the end has met the beginning and purpose has been fulfilled the end has met the beginning and purpose has been fulfilled Hosanna to the son of David Hosanna to the highest today may this season cause an end to a phase in your life and may it cause the beginning of a higher purpose for you. As you enter in the triumphant entry, may the glory stolen by wickedness or evil be restored as Jesus touches your feet. May your loneliness, your rejection be touched as he affects the lowly as a servant. And may your greatness, your rising in power and authority be touched as the king associates with the great that your life 
will be complete in the place of need and in the place of plenty in the place of humility and in the place of greatness in the place of servanthood and in the place of leadership your life shall be complete you have come full cycle when the end meets the beginning purpose is fulfilled the lord bless you and keep you and watch over you even in this day give him a clap of praise if you can this morning wonderful wonderful to him be all the glory to him be all the praise to him be all the honor as we pray this morning i wanted to ask god i hope you have finished the purpose of your last year that you can begin the ecclesiastical calendar of the new season and as you enter this new ecclesiastical year tell god let me know exactly what I'm entering this year for. That when I walk in it successfully at the end, my end shall meet my beginning. And I will have come full cycle. Ask the Lord and pray that any glory that has been taken away from you. Because of mistakes you could have made yourselves. Or because of something people did to you unfairly. May that glory be restored by the Lord. May the same God who rides with you in the lower place ride with you to the highest place. And notice how he enters Jerusalem. The common people. The lowest of people. Others were scared to ever enter Jerusalem. But because of Jesus, some of them for the first time entered Jerusalem. They entered the place of greatness. Today, as you listen, wherever you are, humble as you are, serving God faithfully, may the Lord carry you to the place of greatness. And from the place of greatness, begin again as a servant and serve the people. When the end meets the beginning, purpose is fulfilled. Father, I thank you for everyone today that is out there. In case you lost your sense of purpose, your life is just drifting with the wind left right and center anything carries you you have no anchor in your life say with me heavenly father just as jesus had purpose i want to rediscover my purpose forgive me for my sins for running away from my purpose for thinking i was clever in my own understanding have mercy on me I return home. Wash me in your blood. Clean me again. As you cleanse the disciples. Restore the glory of my life. That Satan will not strike my heel. But I will bruise his head. The kingship he has stolen from me. When I bruise his head. I will reclaim the kingship. I receive you as my savior. And as my Lord, I rededicate my life to you. Walk with me, O God. In Jesus' name. And I declare restoration in your life today. I declare the glory the enemy took away from you. As you crush his head, you will restore the crown into your life. And that you will honor Jesus by that. To the glory of God. Amen and amen and amen. Give God a clap of praise if you can today. Remember on Thursday at 17.30 you are joining us again. And now I encourage you to prepare your offering as we give to the Lord. Thanking him for walking with the king and with a servant within himself. And knowing exactly when to release a king and when to release a servant. We want to give him an offering of thanksgiving. The people of his time took their clothes and put them on a donkey. They laid them on the streets for the king to ride. Take your offering. Let the king ride in the praises of your offering. The screen will have the means you can give electronically. Or if you want to come physically to church anytime, the accounts window is open. It has a, a sign, accounts window, offering window. It will always be open. Drop your envelope there, mark it with your name and your phone number so they can tell you that they have received your offering to the glory of God. And where you are in your home, be upstanding. As your end meets your beginning and purpose is fulfilled, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Say to anyone near you, peace be with you. Peace be with you. 
peace be with you peace be with you 